a todos. Bienvenidos aquí al nuevo programa de Decíamos Ayer, en el que hablaremos de Felipe V y también eh, de ese resurgir español. Y para ello contamos con un invitado de lujo, como es bueno, Christopher Istor, es historiador hispanista, eh, británico y profesor en la Universidad de St. Andrews. Es autor de varios libros eh, acerca de la historia de Europa, entre ellos La resistencia a la monarquía hispánica y el libro que nos trae hoy aquí, como es El resurgir español. Eh... All right, so Philip V is the grandson of Louis XIV, the King of France, um, uh, a, a younger son of uh, Philip of sorry of Louis XIV's son, and so he's not in line initially to be French king, um, although in the end, given the number of deaths in the French royal family, he does have a claim on the French crown. But in 1700. Louis XIV accepts the will of Carlos II, which offers the, French, the Spanish throne to Philip of Anjou, the Duke of Anjou, and he becomes Philip V of Spain. Okay, well, of course, as I've just um, made clear, Philip only becomes king of Spain in the first place because his grandfather accepts the will of Carlos II. Because before that, Louis XIV had agreed with King William III of England to partition the Spanish Empire. But in, 70, in, in 1700, Louis XIV, in fact, ignores the partition treaty and accepts the will. So, so Philip it only becomes king of Spain because of the decision of his grandfather. Um, and then Philip succeeds. He wins the war of succession with the aid of French arms, money and men. So he, he only remains king of Spain because of French uh, support. Um, and uh, Throughout the reign, Philip always thinks of himself, I think, as in some way a Frenchman. Uh, when Louis XIV died, there are a number of deaths in the French royal family between 1700 and 1715 when Louis XIV dies. And that means that when Louis XIV dies, he succeeded by a five year old child. Louis the Fifteenth, and Philip, Philip the Fifth, thinks that perhaps he may become King of France, and this is always in the back of his mind. Although by the treaty which ends the War of Succession, he is supposed to renounce his claim on the French throne. But there's always this idea in Philip's mind that maybe he might become king of France. Now, that idea disappears as Philip, uh, sorry, as Louis the 15th survives childhood, becomes an adult. And so that, that idea of becoming French king disappears. But, but, uh, but Philip has always had this idea that, that he is to some extent French. He arrives in Spain with French ideas and a French entourage. And uh, some of the changes which he introduces in Spain are influenced by his French background. But I, I think increasingly, uh, research is showing that Spain in the War of Succession was not as dependent as we used to think on French support, arms, and so on. And in fact, on a number of occasions, uh, Philip refuses to do what, what Louis XIV wishes. So at one point, um, the war is going very badly for France, and Louis XIV wishes to end the war. And one of the options 
is for Philip to abandon Spain. Uh, but he refuses to do this. And this is this is this is suggesting that really he's, he's becoming Spanish. He's losing that French identity with which he arrives uh, in 1700. And similarly, uh, in 1714, Louis XIV advises Philip to not be so hard on the Catalans. But Philip goes his own way and really imposes a much harsher settlement on the Catalans than his grandfather had suggested. And I'd also like to suggest that while we, we, we think that Philip is very much dependent on French support, to some extent, both Louis XIV and later Louis XV, they also, in, in different ways, they depend on Philip and Spain. So it's a two-way process, I think. Well, um, yes, to some extent that is true. I mean, what one of the one of the things we have to be aware of, I think, is that this process of Frenchification, Afrancesamiento, doesn't suddenly begin in 1700. There are some people in Spain who uh, admire the French model of government before 1700 and um, are willing to support a, a French king introducing French styles, um, but also um, a, a rather sort of more simplistic uh, thing to look at is fashion. If you look at some of the portraits of uh, members of the French elites before 1700, they are adopting French fashions. For example, the, the long wig or, 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 or other styles of dress. So Frenchification is already, I think, evident among certain sectors of the elite and broader Spanish society before 1700. Well, subordinated, I think, goes goes too far. Uh, Spain, certainly, Philip, of course, we're talking about Philip, really. Um, mm -hmm. Philip, to, to a degree, depends upon French support, French arms. Uh, but increasingly, in the course of the War of Succession, Spain is emancipating itself, becoming more independent of uh, France, as, for example, the armaments industry uh, develops its production, for example. And, of course, um, when, when Philip um, establishes himself securely on the throne of Spain, he is no longer so dependent upon, upon France. And, and then, of course, uh, from 1715 onwards, with um, France ruled by a, a child king, uh, it's much more difficult for France to um, assert any sort of control over, over Spain. In fact, there are real tensions between France and Spain because, um, as I said uh, a few months ago, Philip has his own designs on the French crown, and these are um, opposed by the regent of France, the Duke of Orléans. Now, uh, there, there is some truth in this. We have to be careful. I think this attack on the legacy of 1700, the legacy of the Habsburgs, becomes, I think it becomes more prominent uh, in the later 18th century. You get some of the reformers under, say, 
and Charles III, they're, they're using this argument that um, the Bourbons inherit uh, Spain in terrible conditions, in a, in a terrible state of decline and so on. There, there is some of that under Philip V, but I think we have to be careful because uh, Philip inherits the throne uh, be, as, a, as it were, the gift of Carlos II, so that Philip has to some extent to maintain the inheritance that he gets from the last of the Habsburgs. And so one of the things that drives Philip's policy uh, during and after the War of Succession is to actually protect that inheritance, the patrimony that he's been given by Carlos II. So it, it seems to me there's um, it's rather ambiguous or ambivalent. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, yes, they want to say things were uh, didn't go so well under the Habsburgs, but on the other hand, uh, Philip has to retain and, and recover parts of that inheritance that had been lost in the war of succession. Well, um, he, he relies on it quite a lot. Um, I, I've, I've done some work in the past on Spain under Carlos II. And one of the things that strikes me very much is that, well, a lot of people talk about Spain under Carlos II being in a really terrible state of decline. I, I, I've always been more impressed by the extent to which that empire, what, what, what historians call the monarchia, actually survived. And uh, a lot of historians, particularly foreign historians, but, but some Spanish historians as well, say that Spain only survives in the reign of Carlos II because of foreign uh, support, the intervention of the Dutch of uh, England and of Austria, the Austrian Habsburgs. But I, I think there's more to it than that. And that what we have under the last Habsburg is a, a quite an effectively functioning system. And in, in a way, the survival of Spain under Carlos II is an indication that the personality of the monarch did not matter so much, that in fact, it managed to work, to function, despite the fact that the individual sitting on the throne in the Alcaza in, in, in Madrid was actually not the most effective of sovereigns. So, so mm -hmm. Philip, to some extent, inherits this functioning system. Mm -hmm. So he is so, able to benefit from the legacy of the Habsburgs. Well, I, I think I think it's a bit of both. There are some areas where there is rupture, but there are other areas where there is continuity. The most obvious area of, of rupture is obviously the relationship between Madrid and the territories of the Crown of Aragon, where with the Nueva Planta imposed upon Aragon, Valencia and Catalonia, um, there's a, a real transformation of relations. But, but Philip's relations with other foral territories, Vizcaya, Navarra, were very good. And although there is some, some upset during the course of his reign, on the whole, those territories retained their foral status. Um, so Philip found that he could work with Navarra and Vizcaya, so there was no need or opportunity to change the relationship between Madrid and those 
foral territories, whereas it was very different. But I, I, I think we have to be very careful that there are some areas where, where, where Philip does change things quite radically, but in other areas, not. Uh, well, there are some reforms that begin under Carlos II, reforms of the financial administration, and um, the, these continue under Philip. Th there are other reforms that are clearly uh, the initiatives of Philip V's reign, Philip V and his ministers. Now, to some extent, these are made necessary by the war, um, in, in which case, uh, Philip, although Philip arrives in Spain in 1700, he's a product of Louis XIV's France. He has a correspondence with Louis XIV, Louis XIV advising him on how he should govern. Uh, and clearly, Philip has, um, he's more inclined towards this French model of government, which is rather different to that of Habsburg Spain. But I think that we, we need to be aware of the fact that the war created new demands, new pressures, and also new opportunities for change. And some of the changes that Philip then goes on to introduce, that, that creates further pressures, tensions, opportunities, so it triggers further um, reforms. Yes, uh, we, we, we have to be careful to think that everything is coming out of France. Uh, Philip is aware that Spain is a rather different country to France. And if he didn't, if he didn't know that when he first arrived, he, he would ha have had to become aware of it. But, for example, the introduction of central secretariats or departments of state, um, this is very much like what they have in France. So there is a there's a balance to be struck in our um, vision of, of Philip. I think that yes, there are some things which we could say, well, this is what they did in France, but it isn't necessarily that Philip is slavishly adopting a French model of government. I don't think he's arriving saying we must introduce French institutions. It may well be that as um, these pressures of war uh, develop then the the responses in this in this crisis are very much like those that the french have but it's not the deliberate imposition on spain of a french blueprint or model Okay, this is a this is a very big subject, right? Yeah. Okay, so Spain, uh, Spain emerges from the uh, War of Spanish Succession transformed. Uh, Philip is king in Spain; he's retained Spanish America, and of course the Philippines, um, but he's lost everything outside Spain in Europe. Uh, so he's lost Spanish Milan, Spanish Naples, Spanish Sicily, Spanish Sardinia, and Spanish Flanders. Uh, and Philip has been obliged to make concessions to, for example, the English, because he's lost Gibraltar, he's lost Menorca, and he's been forced to allow the English, this is an extraordinary development, to allow them legal access to Spanish America with what, what's called the permission ship and the Asiento de Negros. Um, now, Philip resents all this. 
and Philip, Philip wishes to overturn the peace settlement of 1713. It's also um, worth pointing out here that in 1713, his rival, the, uh, the so-called Charles III, the Archduke Charles, he is, does not make his peace with Philip in 1713. So there is a, a, a sort of war still going on with the Austrian Habsburgs. Now, Philip then wants to overturn the peace settlement. And so for the next generation, Philip is pushing, um, trying to revise that major peace settlement of 1713. Um, and I said a few moments ago that he um, is, is king of Spain by virtue of the will of Carlos II. And Philip feels obliged to recover all those bits of what Carlos II had given him and which had been lost in the War of Suc Succession. Now, one of the things I find quite interesting about Philip, you mentioned the Mediterranean, is that he, he, he lost Spanish Flanders. Now, Philip would like to recover Spanish Flanders, but it is not a priority. Uh, th this I find very, very interesting because for the last 200 years, the Habsburgs, one of their great priorities has been Flanders. Now, Philip fights no wars in Flanders after 1713. This seems to me one of the big contrasts between him and the preceding Habsburgs. So Philip's focus is very much on the Mediterranean rather than on Northern Europe. And um, I, I sort of continue with this context because it is very important. So mm -hmm. Philip's Spain is stronger uh, because he's he's won the crown, he's got the resources of the Indies, and he's pushing his Spanish subjects uh, to find men for his army and to pay taxes to fund his wars. Um, and Philip's using this um, this enhanced resource, as it were, to more more aggressively. One of the big differences between the reigns of Philip V and that of Carlos II is um, in the reign of Carlos II, Spain is a problem for Europe because of its weakness. Under Philip, Spain is a problem for Europe because of its strength, but also because its king is so much more aggressive. He wants to use Spain's resources, its, its power, to uh, cause trouble in Europe. Um, so in 1717, he uh, invades Sardinia. In 1718, he invades uh, Sicily. And this creates a real problem for the surrounding powers. And one of, one of the other factors in play here is, look, power is very much a relative thing. And Philip is powerful in part not just because he has enhanced um, resources, um, um, a, a better army, for example, but also the surrounding powers are weaker. So, for example, um, Austria, Britain and France are all monarchies in dynastic crisis in the period after 1713. And of course, the Dutch Republic, which had been a major power before 1713, in effect, is so badly affected by the war of the Spanish succession that the Dutch for the next generation more or less adopt a position of neutrality in European affairs. So they no, no longer play that really important part that they played under Louis XIV in, in reigning in French power. But to return to the situation, this dynastic situation in these surrounding countries, um, France, I've already, uh, I've already referred to, where um, Louis the fifth, Louis the fourteenth, sorry, is succeeded by a child, um, and that we don't know whether that child will survive childhood in an age when so many children die. Um, but in England, uh, Britain, sorry, 
you have the problem of the new Hanoverian dynasty under George I and George II. Uh, their throne is threatened by the Jacobites who want to restore the Stuarts, James II and his children, who had been thrown out of England in what we call the Glorious Revolution of 1688. So in 1715, there is a, a Jacobite rebellion in England and Scotland. And in 1719, Philip V supports a, uh, an invasion of Scotland uh, from uh, ships based in Galicia. Um, and it, Britain's enemies are always find it useful to exploit this Jacobite threat to um, the Hanoverian dynasty. And one, one, one final point about the dynastic problem of the Austrian Habsburgs, the uh, so-called Charles III, the, the Archduke Charles, the, the Emperor Charles VI, he has no sons. And as, as the decades go on, he's increasingly concerned to secure the succession of one of his daughters, who eventually succeeds him in 1740 as Maria Theresa. And so these territories, these rivals, competitors of uh, Philip V, Austria, France, and Britain, they're all to, a, to an extent weaker because of the nature of the political system. These are hereditary monarchies. It's also worth pointing out, I think, that the War of the Spanish Succession was a really major conflict, and it stretched the resources of all the states which participated. And so in and after 1713, they just want a period of peace and recovery in order to rebuild their resources. And so although um, on occasion they are forced to confront Philip, to fight him, on the whole, they prefer to try and buy him off uh, with diplomacy. And so what we see is particularly um, Britain really doesn't want to fight Philip uh, because they want him to give them privileged access to America. Um, so Britain does occasionally fight Brit uh, Spain, but on the whole prefers diplomacy. Uh, and I often think that Spain's position in, in, in Europe between 1713 and the 1740s is a little bit like that of Germany um, between the two world wars. It's a, a power which has been defeated and which resents the losses imposed by the peace settlement and wants to revise that peace settlement. And it seems to me it's, it's always the case that a troublemaker um, often is, people have to buy off a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> as you mentioned, the Spanish Succession War was a really costly war for all the powers that intervened in it. That's why it's really surprising when you uh, see the campaigns of Philip V, all the numbers of troops, uh, ships involved in those campaigns in Africa and Italy. So the question is, how did Philip V and his, gover and his government manage to mobilize such a large amount of resources? Um, okay, so during the course of the, the, um, the war, uh, Philip raises a lot of troops. And of course, with the with the peace, the a lot of those troops are demobilized, sent home, but not all of them. And in the course of the war, also before 1700, there are very few troops, armies in Spain itself, because Spain itself is really very peaceful. Um, there are hardly any wars fought within Spain in the period of the Habsburgs. Well, there's the, there's the Catalan Revolt in the 17, uh, 1640s, sorry, and also the war against Portugal. But on the whole, the Iberian Peninsula is a very, very peaceful 
place. What Spain has is armies outside Spain. So we have the army of Flanders and the army of Lombardy and various units in other parts of the Spanish Empire. So, for example, there's a there's a tertio in in Sicily. Now, with the loss of these overseas territories in Europe, those armies, or the men in them, uh, return to Spain. So that's one source of troops in the course of the war. After 1713, Philip is able to recruit men um, in part by simply uh, privatizing recruitment. So there we have a very good example of the fact that what we um, we were talking earlier about introducing French models of, of government. But those French models are not always simply authoritarian or absolutist. So Philip works with members of the elites to recruit men. And it's to everybody's advantage to do so. Um, where this uh, can't happen... The, the state does step in to um, look after recruitment. And there's also recruitment of foreigners, for example. So there are a lot of Swiss, Swiss from the Catholic cantons, still in the, uh, the Spanish service. From the, from the 1730s, Philip reforms and mobilizes the militia. That is... Um, um, a form of service which is um, obligatory for men between a certain age. And what we see in the 1730s and particularly the 1740s in the War of the Austrian Succession is Philip uses these troops, these, he uses the militia to uh, replace regular troops in the regular army who are then being deployed in Italy to uh, fight the uh, the enemy. So we've got various ways of raising troops, um, but you also mentioned the, the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's astonishing the extent to which in the 18th century, Spain becomes a major naval power. Um, it's the third most important naval power in Western Europe, indeed in Europe generally, after Britain and France, and it's it's a rather um, it's a rather checkered process because Philip starts the process of building the navy up immediately after the War of the Spanish Succession, but that navy um, suffers very badly in the Sicilian War with defeat by the uh, the British navy uh, in Sicilian waters in 1718. I, I I hesitate to say this, but this is one of the um, one of the greatest British naval victories over the Spaniards. It tends to be forgotten when people talk about the Armada and Trafalgar. But the, the Battle of Cape Passaro is quite important because it's a setback for Philip's plans to rebuild the navy. But in the 1720s, and particularly in the 1730s under José Patiño, who is um, an exile from Spanish Italy, when, when Spanish Italy collapsed, Patino is one of those exiles who heads to Spain. And mm -hmm. as, um, basically, he's chief minister uh, in the, seven, in the um, late 1720s, 1730s. And he's responsible for building up the navy, the, the, first, the first really important stage of rebuilding that navy. Um, and it, it all comes to fruition under Charles III, when Spain is a really significant naval power uh, and mm -hmm. sorry philip philip does this in various ways they um they develop shipbuilding in spain itself but also in spanish america and um they also they re uh, they reform the system of a, a sort of naval militia what's called the matricula and so those in the, those men living around the coasts, they sign up for a system of obligatory service when needed uh, in the King's Navy. Uh, so th th they, they develop a, and that is, by the way, a system which is very much modelled on the French system of uh, a, a naval militia. <laughs> 
Right. So it, you're you're absolutely right. It's very costly. By the way, a navy is far more expensive than an army. Um, and the navy, sorry, the navy is funded. The army is funded. Everything's funded in in various ways. So for one thing, of course, it's very important that Philip retains Spanish America in the War of the Spanish Succession. One of the things that's really astonishing about the War of Succession is that it's not really fought out across the Atlantic. It's all centred in Spain and in Europe. So Philip hangs on to Spain and the Indies. And so he gets he's still getting the resources of the Indies in the, the year 1713 to 46. But he's also putting pressure on his Spanish subjects. So, for example, the end of the foral regime in the territories of the crown of Aragon enables Philip to impose on Aragon, Catalonia and Valencia uh, taxes, which means that they are contributing to the total cost of government in a way that was never the case under the Habsburgs. But uh, despite this additional contribution, this new contribution by the Crown of Aragon, the uh, fundamental basis of uh, Spain's uh, government, its resources, is taxation in Castile. And Castile um, is being um, forced to pay more. So the various taxes that are levied, they are uh, going up. Uh, but also, Philip is resorting to a various extraordinary measures uh, to raise funds. So, for example, from the late 1730s, he's selling off common lands and wastelands. Now, these, these measures, uh, not surprisingly, they cause some resentment. So, although... Although it never leads to serious discontent of the sort which might be expressed in riot or rebellion, there is some discontent such that when Philip dies in 1746 and is succeeded by Ferdinand VI, uh, the son, uh, one of the sons of his first marriage, um, Ferdinand, this is one of the reasons why Ferdinand um, is not really inclined to continue the war. So that within two years of Ferdinand's accession, the war of the Austrian succession is concluded because Ferdinand does not want to carry on pouring money into a war which is being fought primarily in Italy to benefit the sons of uh, Isabel Farnese, uh, a war which is also damaging Spain's interests in the Atlantic. So Ferdinand wants to put an end to all this Italian uh, adventure and focus on rebuilding Spain's position in and across uh, the Atlantic. It's also fair to say that the um, Ferdinand's reign sees a marked reaction against the idea of French influence in Spain, which, uh, thinking back to what we were saying earlier, this idea that Philip's reign is one associated with the import of French ideas, uh, French models, and so on. There is definitely a reaction against that uh, under Ferdinand VI, who prefers better relations with, with Britain. Okay, this is another very, big, very big subject. Okay, so I started off by saying, oh, I said a few moments ago, that Philip has his own agenda in Italy, right? He wants to overturn the peace settlement of 1713. And that means he wants to recover Naples, Sicily, Sardinia, Milan, 
Um, Isabel Farnese, who is, of course, his second wife, right? His first wife died in 1714, and he, he remarries very quickly. F Philip's, Philip's a king who needs uh, a queen. Uh, so Philip remarries, and his second wife, uh, she, she's not at all clear what's going to happen to her should Philip die. She, she becomes very unpopular in Spain, it has to be said. Um, and she's not sure what's going to happen to her or what will happen to her own children, the future Charles III, for example, Carlos III. Uh, and because the when Philip dies, he's going to be succeeded in Spain by the children of his first marriage. So Ferdinand, uh, Ferdinand VI, and of course, the uh, Louis I, who uh, succeeds in 1724 and dies the same year, a very brief reign. So Isabel Farnese, uh, as a member of the Farnese family, has got claims on territories in Italy. But these are not the same territories that Philip is interested in. So although Isabel Farnese is a very forceful woman, very, very strong personality, um, and she is very keen that Philip intervenes in Italy, um, but she's, her, her focus is slightly different. And it's, it, it seems that that we may exaggerate the extent to which she dominates Philip. Um, so Philip has his own agenda in Italy. So going to Sardinia in 1717, going to Sicily in 1718 is Philip's concern. Um, I should also add here, and we'll, we'll come back to all those other people who are interested, those exiles and so on. But I just want to say something about other areas of the Mediterranean, because Philip, as a Spanish king, inheriting the patrimony that's been left to him by Carlos II, also has to be concerned about North Africa. Because, um, of course, you, everybody listening to and watching this will be aware that in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella had conquered Granada, putting an end to Moorish Spain. Now, that Moorish Spain had been put together from the 8th century when Moorish armies crossed the very, very narrow stretch of water between North Africa and Gibraltar. This is a very, very easily crossed stretch of water. And although we tend to think 1492 is the end of the Moorish threat. This was not the way that contemporaries saw it. And in fact, Ferdinand and Isabella very soon started to establish their own presence in North Africa, on the North African coast, uh, occupying fortified positions, presidios. And so this is always uh, an important area of Spanish defensive interest, which we tend to forget because we are more interested in America, in Flanders, and in Spanish Italy. But it's a very, very important concern for Spanish monarchs throughout the early modern period. Now, during the War of the Spanish Succession, uh, the Moors had besieged Ceuta, and they had taken Oran. And after 1713, Philip wants to recover Oran and put an end to the siege of Ceuta. So and Isabel Farnese is not interested in this at all. Um, an another aspect of this is it's also part of a certain crusading mentality that I think Philip buys into. Philip is a very traditionally pious, religious person. And uh, Again, I think this differentiates him a little bit from Isabel Farnese. OK, so I think we've uh, I, I tried to get a, a, across to you the, the idea that Philip has got some very traditional Spanish uh, influences on his policy in the Mediterranean. And that this is not necessarily what's driving Isabel Farnese, but she is certainly interested in uh, an aggressive policy in Italy. But yes, there are other people involved. Now, there are 
Spaniards who uh, have property in Italy and many of them who flee from Spanish Italy uh, when Spanish Italy collapses in the War of the Spanish Succession, they want to recover that property. There are all sorts of people who have got um, ancestry in uh, Spanish Italy. They feel a connection with Spanish Italy. Um, there are um, exiles who uh, go to Spain um, in the 1710s and who are naturalized. They take up Spanish national identity. They become naturalized Spanish subjects in order to be able to hold office in Spain. Uh, but met for many of these people, this is a temporary thing. <coughs> and they, their ultimate aim is to get back to enjoy their property um, back in Spanish Italy. So there are there is, if you like, a pressure group, a lobby, um, uh, which is behind Philip in his efforts to recover Spanish Italy. And of course, when, when the Spaniards, when Philip, uh, Philip's forces are occupying Sardinia between 1717 and 1720, when they're in Sicily between 1718 and 1720, uh, they find people who cooperate with them. They find people who collaborate. And when the Spaniards, when Philip is forced to withdraw his troops in 1720, um, those collaborators, they too, many of them, some of them, go into exile in Spain. So that exile community is to some extent growing. And so there's an ever larger group in Spain <clears throat> who want Philip to succeed in his efforts to reconstruct, rebuild Spanish Italy. Very important. Uh, so, yes, you're absolutely right. There is, um, there has been an idea around for decades that Italy, fo following Columbus's opening up of America from 1492 onwards, that the development of the Atlantic means the end of the Mediterranean as a, um, a central area of economic and political importance, the decline of the um, the end of the Renaissance based in Italy and all that sort of thing. Um, but it's increasingly, the, we're increasingly aware that in fact, the decline of the Mediterranean has been exaggerated. And in the 18th century, the Mediterranean certainly remains important. So for one thing, it's um, the route, it's one of the routes to the east. So the um, what we know as the Levant trade of various companies which make their way through the Mediterranean to the east, to the Ottoman Empire. Um, and for ships making their way eastwards in, in that way, places um, Spain, Sicily, Naples, these are all quite important stopping points on the, the, the journey to the east, which is one of the reasons why so many states are actually quite concerned about who is in control of, for example, Sicily. Uh, but also um, Sicily and other uh, parts of the uh, Mediterranean uh, are important sources of grain. So under the Habsburgs, uh, Sicily, had been a source of grain for Spain um, at time in times of need. Um, and in the 18th century, uh, ports like Livorno um, in, in the, what was then Tuscany are quite important centers of commerce. So yes, the Mediterranean is quite important. A lot of states are concerned in the Mediterranean 
and the trade that can be done in it and the trade that they can get by passing passing through it. Um, I think he owes a lot to the reign of Charles II. Charles II left him a truly global empire. Uh, again, this is um, I, I, I return to my my earlier work about the reign of Carlos II, and and um, I, I, I want to challenge these ideas of this terminal decline of Spain. Spain has difficulties under Carlos II, but Carlos II hands over to Philip V a really enormous global monarchy. We have all these territories in the Americas. We have all these territories in Europe. Um, and really, um, the, 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 the king who loses most is Philip V. And he feels an obligation to recover these territories, which is what I've been saying, I think, for most of our, our, our discussion. And the, one of the pressures on him is he has lost so much of what Carlos II had given him. Well, it's interesting that because clearly um, he creates a very new Spain, right? Because the war of succession has left a Spain, which is essentially Spain and the Indies, not Spanish America. Um, and he doesn't really rebuild, despite all his efforts, the... Um, empire that he had inherited. To some extent, of course, uh, Philip V is very much like the Habsburgs because he, um, he sacrifices everything to foreign policy and foreign wars in his efforts to rebuild uh, the Spanish Empire in, in Europe. Um, he does very much what the Habsburgs had done, what Charles V had done, what Philip II had done, and what Philip IV had done. He um, forces his subjects to um, give him enormous sums to spend on foreign adventures. And, and many historians think that what the Habsburgs had done, and I'm saying what, what Philip is doing, is really wasting the resources of Spanish America, um, not entirely to the benefit of Spain. And some historians would say that Philip and indeed the other Bourbons who follow him in the 18th century, what they do is instead of addressing Spain's fundamental problems, economic and social issues, they, they waste the opportunity and resources they have um, on these, as I say, these foreign adventures. And it's one of the reasons, of course, that Isabel Farnese becomes so unpopular in Spain that Spaniards think she's taking their resources, Spain's wealth, wasting it to establish her sons in Italy rather than doing anything for Spain. Uh, and so I suppose when thinking about that long-term legacy, I think Philip sets a pattern which the other Bourbons follow, and which means that in the long term, they're building up, or they're not addressing, they're not solving problems which will come to the fore after 1789 and after 1808, and which in the end will mean the end of the Spanish Ancien Regime or Antiguo Régimen. Mm -hmm. That's some legacy. <laughs>